Was there ever a real giant named Goliath? Or is this Bible story just pure fantasy? The story of David and Goliath is a myth. Goliath the giant never existed. Goliath was a real person who had four brothers. And the duel between David and Goliath is also historically accurate. If there ever was a Mount Sinai, where was it? And where are the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments? The story of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai is full of inconsistencies. It is impossible to sort fact from fiction. The very latest archaeological discoveries are providing evidence that facts surrounding the Ten Commandments are true, even to many of the details. Is it even remotely possible that three human beings could survive being burned alive in a blast furnace? Human beings could not have lived through such an intensely hot, blazing inferno. The Bible must be wrong in this case. This account is true. Every detail of the account, from the location of fiery brick kilns near Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar's use of these blazing furnaces as a means of capital punishment, have been confirmed archaeologically and historically. What is the real truth behind the tragic romance of Samson and Delilah? Or did it ever happen at all? First, there is not one hint of historical evidence that Samson or Delilah ever existed. Secondly, the tremendous feats attributed to Samson are so bizarre that any intelligent reader will recognize this story as nothing more than a myth or a fable. The feats that Samson performed are well within human capability. There are many demonstrations of strength performed by modern strongmen that could well rival Samson. Tonight we look back into the pages of the first continuous recorded history of mankind in the book we call the Bible. We're going to investigate some of its most controversial stories and discover the answers to some very tough questions. The answers we uncover during the next two hours may shock and surprise you. I'm Dennis Weaver. never has been any historical or biological evidence to support the Bible story of David and a giant named Goliath. The only evidence we have are the stories in the Bible. And what is the Bible? Hardly reliable historical information. The evidence from ancient Israelite sources pertaining to David is so extensive that few historians today would even question any of the main details about his reign. David rose from relative obscurity to become Israel's second king. He ruled the 12 tribes of Israel as a powerful nation and founded a royal dynasty that lasted over 400 years. Is this story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel a concocted tall tale? Or is the Bible an accurate historical document of important past events? According to the Bible, this area in Canaan between Shoko and Azekah is where the duel between David and Goliath took place some 3,000 years ago. The Philistines were an excellent Iron Age army when they invaded the Israelite tribal lands, but their chariots and heavy armor were designed for flatland warfare, but useless in the rocky heights of the Israelites. The Israelites under Saul were not a professional army. They were shepherds and farmers who became a guerrilla army defending their land with outdated Bronze Age weapons. But under Abner, Saul's shrewd general, they became formidable fighters, especially when defending their native hills. For almost six weeks, the two forces confronted each other in an impasse that neither seemed able to break. 
The superior Philistine forces had Saul's army bottled up within the craggy hills, but could not successfully attack the guerrillas in their position. Both armies were hungry and frustrated, eager for a strategy that would break the deadlock. I am David, son of Jesse of Bethlehem. My three brothers fight in the army of the Lord. I bring them food. Don't you know the Philistine patrols are crawling all over here? Come, quickly, quickly, boy. It was customary for families of each tribe to send food to the army in the field. And Jesse of Bethlehem sent David with food for his warrior sons and their officers. But on this occasion, David was in for a shock. and frightened goat king! Is there not one man in all your ranks who will come down here and meet me in single combat? He's truly a giant. Did I know a man could grow that big? I spit on your nation! I spit on your buzzard king! And I spit! In the face of your wormy God, Jehovah! Ah! The giant part of the Bible story is its weakest point. It suggests Goliath and his brothers were from a race of giants, for which there has never been a shred of valid scientific proof. In biology, we're able to affirm that isolated genetic pools can and do result in unusual human forms. The very tall Watutsi people of Rwanda and the very short pygmies of the Congo are just two modern examples. Giantism is an unquestioned fact of human life. There have been many, many examples of huge people in modern times, but this is not proof that a race of giants ever existed. The Bible emphatically mentions the Anakim and the Rephaim, two tribes of giants that were destroyed by Joshua's army in his campaign through Canaan. The remnants of these tribes took refuge among the Philistines. Also, there is absolute scientific evidence of such tribes, confirmed by the archaeological recovery of oversized skeletons in Palestine. Further, these Anakim and Rephaim are memorialized on several Egyptian reliefs, which shows them to be unusually tall and fair-skinned. The Rephaimites resided in Gath, a city that served in Goliath's day as a base for military units with special fighting abilities. By converting the Hebrew cubit and span, we're able to determine that Goliath was nine feet six inches tall when he suited up in his armor and helmet. If giants did exist in this area of Canaan, which seems to be proven beyond doubt, why not one named Goliath? Saul, the first chosen king of Israel, was a brave man, frustrated by the long standoff. Soon food will be as but much Abner, of a problem as his captain general, leaders. was a shrewd and careful planner. He was the brains of the Israelite army. Daily, Goliath would taunt the Israelites with insults in an attempt to lure them out into the open. The boy David had never heard Jehovah cursed, and he was badly shaken with the horror. The monster has cursed the living God. Who will we send down to destroy the monster for his blasphemy? Which one of you will go? Hold your tongue, boy. Do not shame us all. You're just a noisy kid and you do not understand. It made David sick at heart that the giant could blaspheme unchallenged, so much that he rushed to get an audience with the king. While in the king's tent, Abner was trying to convince Saul of his plan. This is all too complicated, Abner. It makes no sense to me at all. The Philistines always do battle the same, with their heavy armored phalanxes, war horses, and dreadful chariots. Deprive them of these and we would defeat them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And how would you do that, Lord General? Their horses and chariots are here at the back of their camp in the most heavily defended place. Move the Benjamite archers up these draws on their flanks. Use fire arrows to set their camps ablaze. Create pandemonium. Move the Danite spearsmen to breach their foreguard here and here. Strike into their middle. Philistine perimeter guards gone blind while you're creeping into these positions? If a diversion could be found, something to hold their whole attention until Please, we could sir, deploy these men. Let me pass. I must see the king. It is urgent. I must see his majesty. 
Let me in. To the veteran guerrilla fighters, David's outrage was amusing. But the shepherd boy would not be put off. Let the boy through. For over a month, in spite of the rewards King Saul offered, not one man had come forward. And now a frail shepherd boy pled for the chance, and the king was sourly amused. What is this nuisance? Please, Your Majesty, make me your champion, that I might slay the monster that blasphemes against God. The giant Goliath? He rages against God and against you, mighty king. I have killed bears and a lion, too, that attacked my father's sheep. And I will do the same to this monster that curses God and Israel. David's determination to fight the giant seemed so strong, it gave Abner an idea. Do you value your young life so little that you would foolishly cast it away? God gave me life, Lord General. It belongs to him. What do I see in your eyes, General? I think the Lord has sent us our diversion, Majesty. The main problem I have with this story is that no army would ever risk the outcome of a battle on a single combat. It is too ridiculous for any professional soldier to even consider. A battle of champions was a common Aegean tradition of letting matched champions duel to the death to determine the winner of a battle and to avoid the bloodshed of a full-scale battle. These people genuinely believed that the stronger god was on the side of the winner, which made further combat unnecessary. Hail Goliath of death! In the morning, Israel sends down a champion to answer your challenge! It had come down upon Abner like a revelation from above. Sending a small, frail boy down to meet the mighty Goliath was so absurd, it would divert the attention of the entire Philistine camp but he would have to thoroughly coach David to make the fight last. I will do exactly as you say, Lord General. I will delay fighting the monster, making him pursue me. We must have that time, David. You must keep away from him until our archers have reached the flanks of the pagans. Listen for the sound of the shofar. Saul awakened deeply troubled and saddened at the sight of his frail champion. Has seen many glories. And he tried to make David put on his own heavy armor. Forgive me, Majesty, but I can't wear this armor. It's too big and too heavy. And the sword, I can hardly lift it. What weapon would you use against the mighty Goliath? Just my sling, great one. A simple shepherd's sling? Just so, Majesty. To the archer, his bow. To the shepherd, his sling. According to the Bible, Goliath was wearing 125 pounds of Aegean scale armor, a handheld shield capable of deflecting arrows and spears, a heavy helmet and shin guards, a small leather slingshot and a tiny pebble against an adversary like Goliath puts a strain on even the strongest faith. At first consideration, a simple slingshot would seem a pretty poor weapon to take into a duel to the death. But there are strong opinions to the contrary. Records exist of slingers hurling stone missiles with enough force to shatter helmets, body armor, and even shields. It is recorded that even the ancient tribe of Benjamin had a whole army of slingers who could hit targets up to 200 feet away with lethal accuracy. The idea of David using a sling and stone to kill a professional soldier dressed in armor is as ridiculous as bringing down an elephant with a BB gun. In the Arab world today, particularly among the Palestinians, the sling continues to be used. Both the Greek and Roman armies use deadly slingers. Sling sharpshooters made up a large part of Hannibal's army in 218 BC. But is a sling a deadly weapon? As late as the Spanish Civil War in 1936, slings were being used with deadly results. Just how accurate and lethal are slingshots? Well, we went to Stacy Grosscup to find out. He's a weapons exhibitionist skilled in archery, blowguns, rifles, tomahawks, knives, and of course, the slingshot. 
This sling consisting of a leather pouch and two thongs is a replica of the one carried by David. The ammo I'm going to use are marble-sized lead balls and stones. Brook stones were used by David against Goliath. These sling missiles would have been used in military combat and for hunting in ancient times. The target is a one by eight pine board at about 40 feet distance. As you can see, the ancient sling was quite effective. In the hands of an expert like David, this sling was certainly a most deadly weapon. After the long weeks of frustration, the Philistines' camp was filled with excitement for the promised spectacle of death. It was a foregone conclusion that Goliath would butcher any man the Israelites sent down. So, you great mountain of flesh, you found some sport for the morning. When you slaughtered that Hebrew, you bring his head to me for my tent standard. And I promise you'll walk with me at the front of my triumph when we return to Gaza. And while the Philistines were already prematurely celebrating, Abner was readying his captains to take advantage of the diversion. Time and quick, quiet movement of several hundred men were the keys to success. Get into positions with your men and pray to the Lord God to guide your arms. Go now. And when you hear the sound of the shofar, attack! Abner had understood his enemy well. Within minutes, the entire Philistine camp was crowding forward to watch the slaughter. And Abner's captains began deploying their weapons for the attack. I am David. I accept your challenge. The shock of seeing a slight young boy come to challenge their fearsome giant drew the attention of the entire Philistine camp from the officers down to the horse grooms. Splat, <laughs> what is this? Dare you mock me? You Hebrew dung beetles! You send a child! to make war with the greatest fighter in the world! The Philistine giant was suddenly filled with a trembling rage. As Abner had instructed him, David continued to delay for time, while his peril grew greater. <laughs> 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 not the spear, you stupid ox! Boy's a leapy gazelle, not a charging lion! Pagan flesh. I'm going to carve you up very slowly, you wormy little pup, just because you made me sweat. Ah! 
Finally, the captains had their men into the attack positions. <laughs> Shepherd Sling. Do you think the great Goliath is a slinking jackal that can be stunned by a pebble? Curse the living God, idol worshiper. God will deliver you into my hands. attack was so swift and terrible that the Philistine host was destroyed in a few terrible minutes. In any court of law, the story of David and Goliath is described in the Bible would stand vindicated by the evidence. Experts have proven the existence of giants in both ancient and modern times. We have seen it demonstrated that the slingshot is a deadly weapon. And finally, there is not a shred of historical or archeological evidence to disprove David or his many deeds from the killing of Goliath to ruling a united Israelite nation. There seems to be no end to the controversy surrounding the five books of Moses about major events in Israelite history, including the exodus from Egypt and Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. Was there actually a real Mount Sinai? And were there ever stone tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written? And if so, where are they now? The Bible says when Moses first led the people out of bondage in Egypt, they were of one mind and one goal. But before long, it soon became apparent that they were not one people. However, this was not one unified group, but hundreds of thousands of people drawn from 12 different tribes that had been spread out all over Egypt for centuries. According to the Bible, the weary Israelites traveled long and hard in the arid wilderness before reaching Mount Sinai. Actually, none of the suggested sites in the Sinai Peninsula fit the biblical requirements. The traditional site called Jabal Musa and located near St. Catherine's Monastery fails all of the historical, geographic, and archaeological tests. The priest scribes who wrote the five books of the Bible attributed to Moses could not even decide on whether the sacred mountain of Moses was named Sinai or Horeb. Thirty-seven times it's called Sinai, and 17 times it's called Horeb. There's little difficulty in explaining this apparent contradiction. Sinai and Horeb are the same mountain. Nothing in the Bible suggests that they are not. The differences among the various tribal groups were much greater than their similarities. I call on you again, my goddess. Strange gods were still worshiped, and ancient pagan rituals still practiced. There was no common law to fit crimes and punishment, and violence began spreading like a plague. It soon became apparent to Moses that these differences would destroy the people if they could not be resolved. Deeply saddened and troubled, Moses went out alone with faithful Joshua to pray to Jehovah for guidance. My God! Without your help, 
Your people are destroyed. But for some men, no laws were good laws. And they already hated Moses. My brother chieftains, join with us, I beg you, before it is too late. For this God of his, this Jehovah that nobody but Moses ever sees or hears. The Bible says that God called upon Moses to climb the heights of Sinai and there to wait upon his appearance. Then while Moses prepared his brother Aaron to sit in his place, the news spread quickly through the camp. Namidian wine. You still live well, Azariah. We have all lived well. But for how much longer? We know now what all the fuss was about. Why Moses moved the nation to Sinai. He claims the Lord God has called him to the top of the mountain to receive the laws. What laws? A covenant, he claims. Moses is to receive a covenant of laws from the God Jehovah, which will bind the nation together forever. This must not happen. If there's ever a chance for us to become the rightful leaders of this nation, we must never permit this to happen. But Moses has regained a great deal of the people's faith. The people are like the wine in this vessel. They'll flow in whatever direction they're tilted. What do you propose? When does Moses go up the mountain? By the first light of the morning. Good. Let's start promoting our plans to the tribal leaders. There is no archaeological evidence for the 12 different alleged sites of Mount Sinai. Yet, two of the world's major religions, Judaism and Christianity, base their beliefs in geopolitical systems on the revelation from this mountaintop. The Moses Ten Commandments story is a complete copy of other myths with the names and places changed. The Persian Book of Law was given to Zoroaster amid thunder and lightning. Dionysius, the Greek lawgiver, was shown holding two tablets of stone with laws chiseled into them. For this reason, you cannot take the story of Moses literally. Zoroaster and Dionysius came hundreds of years after the events of Moses on Mount Sinai. And if there was plagiarism, it was not by Moses. The Bible says God had commanded Moses to ascend the sacred mountain and seek the presence of the Lord. Joshua, here's where I shall leave you. This is where you shall wait for me. To determine whether the Ten Commandments were given by God to Moses on stone tablets, we need to ask one simple question. Where are these tablets? No one has ever found these stone tablets. A possible explanation is that they never existed. We can prove that the Ten Commandments were given to Moses on stone tablets, and we also know exactly where the stone tablets are today. There can be no doubt that a unifying code of laws was needed to avoid a disastrous end to the Exodus. But for hundreds of years, what happened at this time has been a trying point of contention among Bible scholars. There are three conflicting stories about the Ten Commandments in the Bible. In one place, Moses cut the stones and wrote on them. In another, Moses cut the stones and God wrote on them. And in the third place, God cut the stones and God wrote on them. If Moses and God can't get the story straight, why should we believe it? God wrote the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets. After Moses broke the original tablets, in anger, he cut another set, and God wrote on these two. In the third case, Moses also cut the tablets, and he himself wrote all the additional laws given by God. Even when Moses had been gone only a few days, the people began to worry that he would never return. In a week, Aaron had nothing left to say that would ease the leaders' minds. But there were others in the vast camp of the Israelites that grew more pleased with each passing day that Moses did not return. For Moses, time was at a standstill. His entire consciousness was focused on the moments when God spoke to him of the laws that would make his covenant. Lord, why have you brought me here? With 
Moses gone so long, the plots that had been simmering in darkness now found their way into the light of day. We've talked and we've planned. If we do not act now, we may never get another chance. The key to the success of our plan is Aaron. But he must be convinced that Moses is dead. When he's assured we want him for a new leader, he'll go along. <laughs> As the weeks became a month, with Moses still absent, the everyday problems of governing grew larger and more difficult. Aaron was not Moses, and the great responsibilities of first leadership were too much for him. With every passing day, Aaron lost a little more control. Enough! Enough! I have to rest. I need time to think. Leave me in peace for a while. Lord Aaron. The plotters had cunningly waited until Aaron was weakened both by the heavy burden of Moses' office and worry for his brother. Azariah has news of Moses, which is only for your ears. He'll tell no one else, not even us. Something has happened to my brother. Please come with us. All day and into the night, Aaron listened. They convinced him that Moses was dead and that the tribes would soon fall into a terrible war among themselves without central leadership. They proposed themselves as the governing council with him as their leader. You yourself must make the golden calf image. Your gold work is known for its skill. But why should I have to make the idol? Surely there are more skilled artists. Because the people must know that their new god is of your making. You are Moses' heir and successor. The people will be much happier worshiping a god they can see. And with us as the council, life will be much easier for you. We've explained everything. Now is the time for a decision. What do you answer us, Lord Aaron? It is magnificent, Aaron. You've surpassed yourself. It's just what the people needed. The golden calf that Aaron was talked into making was an image of the Egyptian god Apis. This god was worshipped only one day of the year, on the Egyptian New Year's Day. Traditionally, the rites of Apis in Egypt were five days of wild partying to ensure prosperity for the new year. Now that the new god had been proclaimed by the Plotos, there was feasting and celebrations all through the vast camp. Then, even as the people in the camps were turning away from Jehovah for the love of a pagan idol, Moses was receiving the word above. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Unlike other law codes, such as the Code of Hammurabi, which was written on an eight-foot stela and stood out in the open air, the Ten Commandment tablets were portable and designed to be kept as a sacred treasure. Although ancient Egyptian and Babylonian stelas, tablets, and wall reliefs were usually done in limestone, basalt rock, or diorite, there is strong evidence that the Ten Commandment tablets were done in granite or marble rock types that are found at the Jebel El Law's Mount Sinai site in Saudi Arabia. Aaron's heart was troubled, but the plotters leaped with delight when Aaron put the idol upon the altar of stone, and the blasphemy was complete. Come, faithful Joshua. Let us bring the law of God down to the people. When Moses reached the base of the mountain, 
he was filled with sudden horror. Oh, Israel! What have you done? Turned your backs on Almighty God. Even as Jehovah our Lord has made you his chosen people, you would go whoring after false gods! Must you make an abomination in your own house? Oh, Israel, you are not worthy to receive the law of God! Kill Moses! Kill Moses, the false prophet! Kill him! Fight the idolaters! All ye who would follow the word of the living God, rise up now! Purge them from our midst! Strike now for the Lord our God! Even as the faithful under Joshua slew the idolaters, Moses destroyed the golden calf. But even while the terrible fires of vengeance burned through the camp, forgiveness and reconciliation was already beginning. According to the Bible, Moses chiseled out a second set of stone tablets and again went to the top of Mount Sinai. But what other scientific evidence is there for identifying the real Mount Sinai and the existence of the stone tablets? Our expert has already established that the type of stone that the commandments were chiseled into is found abundantly on the mountain in Saudi Arabia called Jabal el Laws, the mountain of the laws. Here an artisan is cutting and shaping stone tablets with much the same tools and methods as Moses would have used. Moses would have been able to hew and finish the stone tablets that he carried for his rendezvous on Mount Sinai. These two pieces of granite stone carved in Israel are probably a very close replica of the real stone tablets complete with the Ten Commandments chiseled on them. But even if we can demonstrate the probability of the stone tablets, we are still lacking a site that fits the description of Mount Sinai in the Bible. Or are we? Some recent and very exciting archaeological discoveries have led scientists away from the traditional sites on the Sinai Peninsula, across the Gulf of Aqaba, to an intriguing site in Saudi Arabia. In 1988, we traveled the Exodus route from the tip of the Sinai Peninsula into Saudi Arabia using the Bible and satellite imagery to find the actual route. Inland, 33 kilometers, we found the Bitter Springs of Mara, as mentioned in Exodus 15. Continuing along the route, we came to the clear water springs mentioned in Exodus 15:27. Here, caves were being excavated by Saudi archaeologists. They said they had found writings in these caves indicating that Moses had come through this area and that the tombs of Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, and Zipporah, the wife of Moses, were found in these caves. Important archaeological evidence was discovered at Jabal al Laws, which further supports the biblical account. We found the stone boundary markers for keeping the Israelites off the mountain, but most startling, we found an eight-foot petroglyph of the Egyptian Apis bull god in a campground large enough and with enough water for the entire Exodus tribe. To our amazement, we found the top of the mountain to be black, as if the rocks had been burnt, possibly confirming the biblical scripture that the Lord descended upon it in fire and smoke. Recently, 
In a surprising move, the Saudi government closed down the Jabal al Law's site abruptly and posted a military guard to prevent further exploration of the site. If it allows archaeological excavations of ancient Israelite sites in Saudi Arabia, the House of Saud opens itself up to the anger of the Arab world. Was there a real Mount Sinai? The evidence for Mount Sinai being in Saudi Arabia is overwhelming. Were there Ten Commandments engraved in two stone tablets as the Bible declares? Well, the historical evidence certainly argues in favor of the Moses Ten Commandments account. If we only knew where these tablets were today, we could be sure. But perhaps we already do know. In an archaeological expedition led by Rabbi Shlomo Goran, under the temple ruins in the city of Jerusalem, a heart-stopping discovery was made. We were excavating under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem when we came to an underground room in the direction of the Holy of the Holies. And it was the Ark of the Covenant that Moses placed the Ten Commandments in. But when we came close to the Holy of the Holies, the Arab management of the Temple Mount decided to, to stop our digging and they erected a wall in order to stop us from getting to the Holy Ark. These latest archaeological treasure troves and scientific testings have made a great impression on even the most skeptical critics. In the case of the Ten Commandments, the Bible, once again, appears to be proving a true and valid history. The book of Daniel is certainly one of the three most controversial books of the Bible. Is it a true story or just uh, contrived fiction? For many hundreds of years, the world's Bible scholars have been at odds over this book and whether or not Daniel was actually its author. The whole book of Daniel was written in about 165 BC to encourage the Jews in their independence war against the king of Syria. However, it pretends to have been written some 400 years earlier at the time of the prophet Daniel. One reason that some assume Daniel was written around 165 BC is that the book mentions three Greek musical instruments. It's presumed that these instruments would not have been known in Babylonia before the arrival of the Greek armies in 325 BC. However, cuneiform records and archaeology have shown that Greek traders were already active in Babylonia as early as 700 BC, 100 years before the time of Daniel. It should not be at all surprising to hear of Greek musical instruments at Nebuchadnezzar's court. The biblical Daniel account is loaded with contradictions and chronological errors. It cannot be relied upon as factual history for that Babylonian time period. Archives of cuneiform tablets, which are the official records of ancient kings, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, all discovered this century, prove the book of Daniel to be a highly accurate eyewitness historical record of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, and that it was written during the time period of Daniel. The arguments about the book of Daniel in the period of the Hebrew captivity in Babylon seem almost endless. So how can we know what we should or should not believe? Well, perhaps the easiest way to test the book of Daniel is to examine the one story in the book that's maybe the hardest to believe, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. It was in 605 BC, during Nebuchadnezzar's military campaign in Judah, that four young Hebrew men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were taken away from their families and deported to Babylon to work in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. The young Hebrews discovered worlds they had never dreamed of and became members of the prestigious court of intellectuals. We know from history that Nebuchadnezzar's reign was plagued with attempted palace coups and open revolts. It was exactly one of these that entangled Daniel and his three friends so perilously. Here, here. With each passing year, the king's strange dreams troubled him to near madness. This dream frightens me. I must know what it means. Uh, call in my wise men, my diviners and astrologers.
Do you still have faith in these intellectuals, Lord of Lords? Don't speak in riddles, Vizier. What would you have me believe? If they were truly wise men, you shouldn't have to tell them what you dreamed, Splendid Majesty. Just tell them you dreamed. See if they can tell you both the dream and its meaning. From all indications in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar was troubled mentally all his life. Like many, he was quite superstitious and believed implicitly that his dreams were both omens and warnings. Once the king had been baited, the plotters hurried to the next step of the scheme for seizing the throne. And tell them to hurry to me. They were sure there was no way the wise men could tell the king what he had dreamed, and their fate was sealed. Well, you old fakers, you couldn't guess the dream. Where is all your vaulted wisdom now? Put a fine edge on your blade, neck chopper. Tomorrow you will need it. I can't believe this. Just... The news quickly circulated throughout the court that the wise men were in trouble. Daniel was sick at heart, for the old men were their teachers and their friends. Interpreting dreams has been an entrenched belief among many cultures since our earliest history. Undoubtedly, Daniel, like many modern-day psychologists and psychiatrists, was a keen observer and was obviously able to analyze dreams. Has granted me... Daniel, who had already had a reputation as a dream interpreter, begged the king to stay the execution of the wise men until he and his friends had a chance to guess the king's dream and to analyze it. Then, when Daniel accurately told the king his dream and its meaning, Nebuchadnezzar raised Daniel to first minister and set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as his administrators in the city of Babylon. This was a fiasco, a ruse. Now I am exposed. These Hebrew wise men are all well connected. What of us? We've all been put out of office and the Hebrews put in our place. It is a fortune in craft and bribes. What are we going to do? This thing could destroy us all. Let us not lose our heads. These Hebrews have a weakness that will help us win. Their religion. While a few Hebrews rose to high positions, the greatest part remained in slavery. But over the next few years, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego rooted out corruption wherever they found it. They became famous throughout the kingdom for their wisdom, their honesty, receiving many awards from the king and becoming his favorite officials. After three years waiting, watching, you still find something to smile about, Haruz? The king has had another dream. I'm not going through that again. Listen, the king has dreamed of a monster with a lion's body, a goat's head, and the wings of an eagle. What does that nonsense have to do with us? Let me explain it to you. Marduk, an obscure Babylonian... The treacherous vizier convinced some of the astrologers to help him persuade the king that he had dreamed of the ancient war god of Babylon, Marduk. At this point in history, Marduk had not been worshipped as a god for more than a thousand years. The interesting thing is that he was resurrected again at this particular time, reinstating a primitive idolatry that had been almost completely forgotten. We have divined, O great king, the Marduk demands a colossal gold image be cast in his likeness. The plotters Six had little trouble persuading Nebuchadnezzar that his dream was indeed an omen. And then he demands an edict that all must fall down before Marduk and worship him. Those who do not must be put to death. Let the edict be written and proclaimed throughout the empire. Do you really believe this edict will strengthen my empire, Haruz? I am not sure. It will make you even more famous than your imperial ancestor, Hammurabi. In the generations to come, they will say that you were the greatest lawgiver of all. A golden statue of this size is completely preposterous. 
it would have required 5,500 cubic feet of precious gold, more than has ever been mined in the entire history of the world. Altars, resident temple gods, and statues were gold-plated, not solid gold unless they were extremely small. The ancients had a procedure of hammering gold plating sheets to a thinness of 1 367 thousandths of an inch. Babylon had plenty of gold to make a gold plated image of Marduk. The Marduk statue was supposed to be built in a 10 to 1 proportion. That's 9 feet wide by 90 feet tall, too high to be stable. Ancient people did not have the technology to engineer a statue this high. Most discussions of the Marduk statue presuppose that the Daniel account is talking about a freestanding three-dimensional humanoid statue. The Daniel account only gives two dimensions, height and width, meaning this was not a statue, but rather a relief carved into the side of a mountain or a tower. The Babylonians also built massive structures that Greek travelers called the Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Nebuchadnezzar's engineers were known for their skill in constructing massive structures. They definitely could have built such a structure into which the image of a god, most likely Marduk, was carved as a relief. The wily plotters had the new edict spread across the kingdom in a matter of days. It is done. Everything. Well, how did you ever get it past Daniel? My dear Zarobal, in these matters, timing is everything. Daniel has been sent on a diplomatic mission by the king. He will be gone many months. How will this destroy the Hebrews? Their religion forbids the worship of any god but their own. They will never bow and pray before an image of Marduk. But to Meshach and the others, the edict was a shocking surprise. I knew nothing about this. You say the orders for this construction came from the palace over a month ago? Why do we need the idol of Marduk? Neither of you have heard anything of this before. No. I haven't been to the Valley of Dura since we were in school. Who's behind this new idol of Marduk? The king is no longer an idolater. I sense the dirty hand of Horus in this. I think it's time we pray to God for guidance. With the king's seal on the edict, now the plotters could not have been happy. You have outdone all your sly schemes of the past on this one, Horus. Is the king still convinced that it was Marduk who spoke to him? His superstitious majesty is already issuing orders to his palace court, the army, and officials of the empire to gather a Dura to worship Marduk. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew it was only a matter of time before Haruz would be paying them a sinister visit. A thousand pardons for this interruption, my lords. How may we help you, Lord Vizier? You have, of course, heard of this edict. We've heard. And are you prepared to come with me now to bow and pray to Mardu? You know very well, Haruz, that we would never commit such an obscene and unholy act against our Lord God. Then may I tell you that the three of you are under arrest for high treason and sacrilege. The two most often challenged parts of the story surround the fiery furnace itself and the actual historical existence of the three Hebrew men the Bible calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No matter how hard you want to believe the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there is not one single shred of historical evidence that they were real people. There has never been any certifiable or authenticated evidence of a man called Daniel. It would seem more likely that this story was a folk tale that the Hebrews rumored about during their captivity to keep up their spirits. Then it just became passed down in their oral history. In 1956, with the publication of some of the cuneiform tablets now on display in the British Museum, we learned that in about 593 BC, a revolt against Nebuchadnezzar took place. That revolt provides a natural explanation for the assembly on the plain of Dura described in Daniel chapter 3. In order to ensure the loyalty of his government's officials, 
he had them swear allegiance to his great image. More evidence for this loyalty oath comes from a five-sided clay prism unearthed in Babylon and now on display at the Istanbul Museum. This list is broken into groups by titles, and in it we find the name of Ardi Nabu, Secretary of the Crown Prince. Some superb linguistic detective work proves this to be an alternative form of Abednego, or the biblical Abednego. Next, Hanunu, described as chief of the royal merchants. This is a variation of Hananiah, the Hebrew name of Shadrach. Next, we find the name of Mushalim Marduk, another official of Nebuchadnezzar. If part of the name of Marduk, the pagan god of Babylon, is cut out of this man's name, we end up with the name of Meshach, Shadrach's friend. Interestingly, Daniel's name is not on the prism, suggesting that he was not in attendance at the time, just as the Bible indicates. The ancient clay prism contains conclusive evidence that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there, holding administrative positions under King Nebuchadnezzar. The way the edict was written, not even the king himself could pardon a blasphemy against the god Marduk. Well, this troubled him greatly, but the apparent disobedience of his favorite ministers annoyed him even more. You have served me loyally for many years. I thought you loved me as well as I loved you. Why do you choose now to disobey me? As we love you, great king, we love our God more. You stir a bitter anger in me with these words. We speak no more, majesty. We would offend you no further. You know the penalty for treason is death by fire. If you are condemned, will this God of yours save you? It is written in our scriptures that if our God so wills it, we will be delivered out of the fire. Enough! Marduk is God and I am his king! You have condemned yourselves out of your own mouths. So be it. Pray to Marduk that my servants have been convicted justly, my lords and that you have not led me astray. Another reason this story rings untrue is their absolute belief in the Hebrew God for which they were willing to suffer a hideous death. If they'd been brought to Babylon as boys, their old beliefs would have faded away with their education. They would have learned to think like Babylonians, not like ritualistic Israelites. During the Spanish Inquisition, there were thousands and thousands of Jewish children who withstood torture and death rather than deny their faith. During the Nazi terror, many Jewish children died for the same reason. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been well instructed in their heritage and religion. And history has demonstrated time and again that severe persecution, rather than destroying one's faith, actually serves to strengthen it. It can be proven historically that the time the Bible story gives, Nebuchadnezzar called his governors and vassal kings to swear a new oath of allegiance to him before the gigantic new idol. Undoubtedly, it was to one of these rituals that the three condemned Hebrews were brought to suffer a public execution. Let us see the heat of your marvelous furnace work, Master. Genius. Indeed, Horus, you have outdone yourself. The so-called fiery furnace is another element in this story that shows its unreality. Why a furnace? If the king wanted to cremate the three sons in front of witnesses, he would have had them burned at the stake, like Joan of Arc, not tossed into a closed furnace. There is ample historical evidence that casting into a furnace was the official form of execution in Nebuchadnezzar's time. Putting to death by fire opponents of one's religion was even practiced in Europe up until about 300 years ago.
The fiery furnace business rings untrue in this story. First, the furnaces used in converting ore to metal would have been quite small, not large enough to cast one man into, never mind three. Second, while the brick drying furnaces of that day were capable of intense heat, they were usually very small due to the limited oxygen supply to burn the fuel. Finally, if the furnace of the Bible belched forth flames that killed several soldiers, there's no way three men could have survived the intense heat. The biblical description makes it very clear that the fiery furnace was a brick furnace. In northern Iraq, on the basis of cuneiform tablets, we have found archaeological evidence of Nebuchadnezzar's brick furnaces that were the size of a city block, used to make bricks glazed with blue, green, and yellow glass for his city gate at Babylon. This is a wall brick fragment from Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar's ancient furnace. It has been baked at such a high temperature that the clay itself has become glass-like. The furnace burned extremely hot from being fueled with pitch and sulfur, which was fanned by bellows to get more flame and heat. Then a glass glaze for color was fired at even hotter temperatures. To find out more about the construction and the function of this ancient brick furnace, we went to Dr. Ron Charles, an archaeologist, historian, and engineer, who designed two similar furnaces for the Owens Corning Company. Here on the computer, is an architectural reproduction of the fiery furnace brick kiln based on ancient archaeological findings and descriptive information from the Bible. The total height of this two-story kiln furnace from here to here was about 32 feet with 20 feet being in the fire chamber area and about 12 feet in the brick baking chamber. Now this last chamber is of particular interest. After the bricks were baked and glazed here they were moved to this finishing oven chamber and placed on sand where their glass hot temperature was lowered slowly to prevent cracking. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the upper finishing oven chamber by the temple priest. They would have landed on the sand which was about 400 degrees underneath and maybe up to a maximum of 150 degrees on the sand's surface. It was in this one chamber that the king ordered his soldiers to increase the heat seven times its normal temperature to kill the trio. When they opened the door to give it more fuel, an explosive backdraft of flames killed the soldiers, engulfing the outside of the finishing chamber containing the biblical trio. This ancient kiln and even modern day brick and glass kilns often have cold spots, uneven areas of heating, places you can literally survive for a period of time unscathed. Apply this cold spot idea to a very large Babylonian brick furnace and the biblical trio, with or without the help of an angel, could have survived the fiery furnace due to a miraculous set of circumstances, just as the Bible describes. The Bible says that not only were the three Hebrews cast into the fiery furnace, but the heat was increased to seven times its normal temperature. <laughs> Finally, when the king ordered the doors to be opened, a great cry of shock went up from the witnesses at the sight. There, in the heart of the great furnace, stood Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with a figure in white behind them. And they were unharmed. Not a hair on their heads had been scorched. In that instant, the king knew that a miracle had been wrought by the God of the Hebrews. According to the Bible, when Nebuchadnezzar saw the power of the Hebrew God with his own eyes, 
He raised Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the highest offices in the empire. Then he had the name of the living God proclaimed throughout the empire as the true and only God. And the edict was obeyed all the years of his reign. Was there a Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And did they undergo an ordeal by fire? Well, surprisingly enough, the bulk of proof seems to indicate that all these things did happen, exactly as the Bible says they did. Research has shown that the story of Samson Delilah has no basis in reality. The name Samson is not Hebrew and is directly traceable to a Canaanite sun god who is superhumanly strong. This story of Samson Delilah is an old pagan legend dressed up in biblical trappings. The name Shimson or Samson is derived from the Hebrew word Shemesh, which means sun or brightness. The name Samson is not uncommon as it's found in the Ugaritic texts as early as 1500 BC, hundreds of years before Samson. Judges 15:15 clearly says that Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. But according to the mythology of other nations of biblical times, Hercules and other strongman heroes did similar feats, defeating entire armies and such like single-handedly. Now, Samson had killed 20 or even 10 of a thousand men rushing to overwhelm him. That would have been remarkable enough, but the whole thousand is just too ridiculous to believe. First, Samson was a man of abnormal strength. Secondly, the jawbone of a donkey is a formidable weapon in the hands of a determined man. And if the misconstrued term Eliph is correctly used, Samson killed 20-some of the despised Philistine soldiers, a considerable feat, but not an impossible or even an improbable one. What is it about the story of Samson and Delilah that stirs the critics so relentlessly in their questioning and makes the Bible defenders so rock hard in their defense. Well, let's begin our examination by looking at the story itself, starting at chapter 13 in the book of Judges. Samson's feats of strength made him a living legend. And as a warrior, he was incomparable. After the conquest of Canaan under Joshua, the Israelites spread over the land and for 200 years, they became farmers and shepherds. But their powerful neighbor was Philistia, who found the scattered Israelites easy targets for taxation and oppression. The heavy hand of the Philistines was everywhere, but the people were not without hope. Samson was a judge over his people, the strongest man in the world, and a feared and hated enemy of Philistia. weary of hearing that name. Just exactly who or what is he? A Hebrew strong man, but more importantly, a Hebrew judge. The Hebrews believe their God appointed him, that he is divinely guided in his judgments and his attacks against us. Are you telling me that one man is the reason our taxes and work levies are not being met? What's the army doing? If we send out a great... Samson's hit and run tactics had frustrated the Philistine army completely. The Supreme Council had to find another way to neutralize the Hebrew leader. I would like to meet this strong man of the Hebrews. Make a truce, General. Arrange it. The Samson story is just a long string of unbelievable yarns about his supposedly supernatural strength. He tore a lion apart with his bare hands, but then so did Hercules. The ability to kill ferocious animals barehandedly was characteristic of almost all heroes in the strongman myths of ancient times. There are many well-documented feats of strongmen on record. There are thousands of modern accounts of even ordinary people performing superhuman feats of strength. Many circuses around the world feature tumbling acts where the bottom man supports the weight of six or more people, often between 1,200 and 1,500 pounds. And in karate, 
There are a great number of experts who can break concrete blocks, even destroy buildings. The Philistine general found it deceptively easy to arrange a truce, so the council leader could meet his avowed enemy, Samson. The Hebrew strongman approaches my lord. Why then welcome him, general. I thought you'd be a much bigger man. But this helps, eh? It has weight. This famous Philistine shield that no sword may dent, no spear may pierce. You may be a strong man, Samson. But how many spears can you survive? Should I call my men? Did you think I would trust your honor? Did you bring me here to play games? To make a peace, Samson. So you can have more time to set your tax collectors on us. A peace with honor. Our people want nothing more than to be left alone. And until the Philistines stop pressing us under their thumbs, there can be no peace. My hate for that barbarian makes my teeth ache. Of course. But hate creatively. When the time comes, revenge will be all the sweeter. We must find his weakness. If Samson really ever existed, he would have been a minor inconvenience to the Philistines. One man would not have made much difference, either in a political sense or a military one. The history of the human race is full of incidents where one man impacted society massively. Alexander, Napoleon, Hitler. Samson probably was the Philistines' biggest problem at that time. There are several non-biblical legends that say, in the time of peace that lasted several years, Samson became a familiar figure in the Philistine cities, and often an honored guest in the homes of the rich and the powerful, where the story took a most fateful turn. From the moment that Samson first saw Delilah, he was captivated. Lord Samson, may I present my niece and ward Delilah from Sorek Valley? It was a meeting that impressed the council's agents. The introduction of Delilah into the Samson story is a typical soap opera device. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a femme fatale shows up. Even her name is questionable. More than likely, the name was concocted by the prescribes who wrote these yarns. While Delilah is neither a Hebrew nor Philistine name, it is definitely Semitic, probably Canaanite in origin, perhaps from Tyre or Sidon. This name Delilah has different meanings, one being with long hair hanging down. And you say he was smitten with the niece of Caliphax? I was talking with Samson and saw it myself. A sizzling spark leapt between them, my lord. Is it possible? <laughs> Could it be that simple? How very marvelous! <laughs> for the next few weeks, it was carefully arranged for Samson and Delilah to continue meeting, accidentally. In the market, at the bazaar, and the stock auctions, everywhere that Samson went, Delilah seemed to be there too. I pardon your lady. Seems we keep bumping into one another. Well, that seems to be your nature, almighty man of the Hebrews. <laughs> right. 
Samson soon became a constant visitor, and his flirtation with Delilah quickly became a fiery love. Shall we play at Samson? As the days passed into weeks, the love of Samson and Delilah deepened. While the Philistine lords watched and waited for the right moment to put their sinister plan into action. I cannot believe this! You, princes of Philistia, noble and high-minded gentlemen, you ask me to betray the man I love? Get Permit me to out. talk to the Lady Delilah alone, gentlemen. We are alone now. There is no need for theatrics. I know your past quite well, my lady. I know you were fond of living beyond your means. The lofty Aristides, a traitor in the gossip of all the hags. <laughs> Your father died an honorable man, but a poor one. Califax will provide a roof and food, but alas, no dowry. You seem very concerned about my future, Lord Aristides. Myself and the other four members of the council are prepared to reward your valuable services to the state with 1,100 shekels of silver, each. 5,500 shekels of silver? A fortune. You would be a wealthy woman, an independent woman. But I love him. You are infatuated for the time being. Infatuations pass, as you know better than most. I cannot betray him to his death. His death? That is the last thing I would want. Oh, then what do you want of him? The secret of his strength. He has long been a menace to the nation. I want him weak and imprisoned as an example to these troublesome people. It is still betrayal. I am of honorable family. Love and honor are only words. Abstractions. Money is real. You can hold it, feel it, buy comfort and luxury with it. Who would be poor rather than rich? I will not be poor. Of course. You are a practical woman. If I knew it meant Samson's death, I could not do it. May Dagon strike me dead if Samson dies because of me. On my oath. The Bible does not clearly indicate why Delilah might betray Samson. But the oral legends of the Jews say it was greed. The temptation of a fortune was just too great for her to resist. From a historical viewpoint, the 5,500 pieces of silver the Philistines offered Delilah as a bribe is really difficult to believe. Nowhere else in the Bible is such a vast amount of money offered for betrayal. Compare the meager 30 pieces of silver that was offered to Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. The pieces of silver of the Old Testament period such as in Samson's time, were actually lumps of silver like this one. Although they were not coins, they were called shekels. These shekels were used for trade and barter throughout the Mediterranean world. 5,500 of these would have weighed about 150 pounds, probably worth about $10,000, a vast sum when considering their pre-inflationary value. This was indeed a vast fortune, suggesting that Samson was now regarded as a national menace. The lady has been bought and well rehearsed. Samson will arrive at Zorik in three days, and she will deliver him to us. This time we will put a collar on this Hebrew bear once and for all. This I promise you. As a Nazarite, Samson could not drink wine. But at the time, the Philistines were importing a fermented milk from the land of the Hittites 
that was a powerful intoxicant. All day long, Delilah tried to pry the secret of his strength from Samson, while the Philistines lay in wait for her signal. We have been here for hours, and now the sun is going down. Three times he has tricked her, and she raised the cry falsely. And we were almost discovered. Are you sure that we can trust her? Patience, Afrion. Greed is the most dependable of all human passions, and Delilah is a very passionate woman. Only God and I know that, Delilah. Are you sure this is only scented milk? You know my vow with God forbids me wine. I swear, it is not wine. <laughs> Do you love me, Samson? <laughs> Come into my arms. I will give you just this one more chance. And if you do not tell me what makes you so strong, I will know you really do not love me. <laughs> and I will go far away from here and never come back. The hair business is another indication that this story is only fiction. Deriving strength from uncut hair is one of those quasi-myths that show up in the literature of every ancient culture. Reality is often what we perceive with the mind to be reality. If a person believes something to be true, then to that person, it is true. In some of the subculture religions, such as voodoo and santeria, as practiced here in the United States, people can grow sick and die from believing they are cursed. If Samson believed that his supernatural strength came from his long hair and from God, then for Samson, this was absolute reality. Once his hair was shorn, Samson was easily made a captive in chains. What have you done with Delilah? She's gone away to seek a new life. A much happier and far richer life, I might add. You lie! Coward! She loves me! She sold you out for money, you witless hulk. <laughs> I despise your face, Philistine. How ironic, Hebrew, that I'm the last man you'll ever see. Now we have a living ruin instead of a dead hero, Afrion. Blind men are pitiful, you see. Hideous, even disgusting. But never, never heroic. Once again, the Philistines swarmed over the land like locusts. As the Hebrew nation lay crushed, Philistia prospered and grew rich. The Bible says that the blinded Samson was shackled and set to grinding grain in the prison mill house, where the public could witness his disgrace and misery. Grinding grain for the king and nobles was a typical prison labor program in ancient cultures. Samson would have sat on the ground along with other prisoners with a mortar and hand pestle for grinding grain. In the spring, the Feast of Dagon drew visitors from every city and village in the empire. On the day of the high festival, the leaders of Gaza were delighted with the spectacle that they had arranged in Dagon's honor. Nobles, priests, merchants, townsmen of Gaza, Philistines all, on this holiest day, I think it is fitting that we first bring forth the creature who dared raise his hand against our nation and our great god Dagon. Look now on the Hebrew Samson. Hail mighty Samson! 
judge of the great Hebrew race. <laughs> On this feast day, welcome to Dagon's temple. Tell me, Lord, are you the only one of importance here? Even the very roof is full of citizenry. The flower of Philistia's noblest families are arrayed before you, including the governor of Ashkelon and his devoted wife, Delilah. And do I stand in the place of judgment between the great pillars of Dagon? If you reach out, you can touch them. We are going to have some sport of you now. If you are through with your questions. Just one. You still have eyes. Can they see any changes the Lord God has made in me? His hair, you fools! His hair's grown back! For my sins, Lord God, forgive me. And only this once, give me the strength that I may be avenged for my two eyes upon my enemies. These stone temples were meant to last through the ages. The pillars of these temples were engineered to carry tons of weight from the roof. It would have taken thousands of pounds of horsepower to pull one of these pillars from under its load. The idea of one man, Samson doing it, is totally unbelievable. The archaeological excavations at Tel Kassila, here at the Eretz Israel Museum at Tel Aviv, give us a rather different picture of Philistine temples than that we've gotten from Hollywood. This place and the model of the reconstructed temple are here in the museum. And this will surprise many people. The pillars were made of cedar wood and not stone. They just rested on this stone basis. These new discoveries about the ancient temples of the Philistines intrigued us so much that we sought out experts in architectural engineering. Here in our computer lab, we have built an architectural model of the Philistine temple mentioned in the biblical story of Samson. It is based on the archaeological findings at Tel Kassila. You can see that it is not constructed along the lines of the later Greek temples, such as the Parthenon. It is considerably simpler, both in its engineering and its construction. These two central pillars support the center of the roof's construction and carry the entire vertical load. These wooden pillars, located six feet apart, whose bottom ends rested on flat stones were the weakest points of the whole construction. It would not take very much force to displace the top ends of these pillars. You wouldn't need much of a displacement to cause a twisting movement in the roof structure which would further displace the pillars and the whole roof would collapse. The added weight and movement of people would create another dynamic making the entire structure unstable. We can now see Samson in our three-dimensional model. For clarity, we have removed most of the people and will have Samson push the pillars as the Bible describes, destroying the temple. Our structural engineers have calculated that this pushing action would have taken about 150 to 250 pounds of pressure to collapse the temple. A very strong man like Samson with his motivation could have easily collapsed the temple, killing the people inside and on the roof. 
The Bible says Samson, in that one final act of collapsing the temple, destroyed the Philistine political and military leadership. Now that act probably contributed to the Israelite victory in the Battle of Ebenezer soon after. The evidence seems to indicate that the Bible is indeed a remarkably accurate record of the events surrounding the story of Samson and Delilah. Of the millions of books and libraries around the world, this one book is the preeminent literary work of all time. Much of it over 3,000 years old and still the unchallenged bestseller. For hundreds of years, it has accompanied explorers who dared to challenge new and unknown frontiers. Columbus carried one in his arms when he took that first giant step into the new world. A Bible accompanied Admiral Perry's discovery of the North Pole. It flew with Lindbergh in the spirit of St. Louis. It was aboard the Contiki for Thor Heyerdahl's epic voyage. And General Norman Schwarzkopf led our forces to victory in the Persian Gulf War with a Bible as his constant companion. And the intrepid and distinguished American astronaut James Irvin carried a personal Bible on his moonwalk. Can there be any doubt that the Bible will be carried along by the new and daring challengers to those frontiers that are yet unimagined?